Hello, everyone. A happy Friday. Thank you for tuning in to today's Friday Forum. My name is Audrey Stewart, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, I am so pleased to welcome you to today's event with Eddie R. Cole discussing his new book, The Campus Color Line, College Presidents and the Struggle for Black Freedom. He is joined in conversation today by Khalil Gibran Muhammad. Harvard Bookstore's Friday Forum takes place on Friday afternoons during the academic year as a way to highlight scholarly books in a wide range of fields. Through virtual events like today, Harvard Bookstore continues to bring authors and their work to our community and our new digital community during these challenging times. Every week we're hosting events here on Zoom and as always, our schedule appears on our website at harvard.com events, where you can also sign up for our email newsletter and browse our shelves from home. Today's discussion will conclude with some time for your questions. If you have a question at any time during the talk, go to the Q&A button on your screen and we'll get through as many as time allows. If you would like to buy a copy of the Campus Color Line, there will be a link in the chat where you can All sales through this link support Harvard Bookstore, so thank you, especially during this difficult time for community spaces like your local bookstore. There will also be a link for donation in the chat if you would like to give additional support to Harvard Bookstore contributions, make this virtual author series possible, and now more than ever, support the future of a landmark independent bookstore. Thank you for tuning in. In support of our authors and the incredible staff of booksellers at Harvard Bookstore, we sincerely appreciate your support now and always. And finally, as you may have experienced in virtual gatherings these last few months, technical issues may arise. If they do, we'll do our best to resolve them as quickly as we can. Thank you in advance for your patience and your understanding. Now I'm so pleased to introduce tonight's speakers. Eddie R. Cole is Associate Professor of Higher Education and Organizational Change at UCLA. He is the recipient of multiple awards for his work, including the 2018 Early Career Award from the Association of the Study of Higher Education, and a 2017 Mellon Emerging Faculty Leader Award from the Woodrow Wilson National Fellowship Foundation. He has received research fellowships and grants from Princeton University, the University of Chicago, and the University of Wisconsin-Madison. He is joined tonight by Khalil Gibran Mohammed, who is Professor of History, Race, and Public Policy at the Harvard Kennedy School. His work has been featured in the New York Times, the New Yorker, and the Washington Post. He is also the recipient of the BPI Chicago's Champion of Public Interest Award and the Fortune Society's Game Changer Award. Today, they are discussing Eddie's new book, The Campus Color Line. Focusing on the period between 1948 and 1968, this book takes a closer look at how colleges across America played a role in the fight for racial equality. Particularly, it takes a look at college leadership and how it continues to affect racial, racial change in America. National Book Award winning author Ibram X. Kendi called it a stunning and ambitious origin story. And on that note of praise, I'll turn things over to our authors. Khalil, Eddie, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. And thank you so much for uh, inviting me to have conversation with someone who I admire greatly. Uh, Eddie was a graduate student at uh, Indiana University in Bloomington at, at a time when I was uh, starting my career as an assistant professor. And uh, I, I've seen him all grow up. This is incredible. <laughs> and I also know his, his academic uh, lineage. Uh, he's a student of Dion Dans, uh, who's a professor also in the School of Education at, at uh, at IU. And what I love about Professor Dan's, uh, also a friend, and what I love now about Eddie and his published scholarship is that they make us historians look good. Uh, <laughs> both of them are historians of education, Eddie of, of higher education. And uh, so much about this book is so important and so relevant about the broader um, national reckoning with uh, race and racism we're having in this country. Uh, and what I'm so struck by um, and this is the reason why I mentioned, mentioned your advisor is because she's seeding, <laughs> seeding uh, scholars who take history very seriously and yet whose professional commitments um, are in fields of professional practice uh, where history is often marginal and not quite uh, as relevant to the work. Uh, so 
that's a big shout out to uh, to both you and and to Dion for for this great work. Eddie, it's so great to see you, man. How, how have you been doing? How's the uh, yeah. book doing um, since it came out? Yeah, I'm doing well. I mean, there's so much going on in the world right now, but I'm hanging in there. And um, the book is really picking up steam. You know, it's one of those things that when you write a book, you never know uh, what society, where the world will be when it comes out. <laughs> uh, so in particular, writing a book about race and institutions of higher education and then having this particular moment, right? I mean, we're having a national even a global moment of racial reckoning, but also, you know, the pandemic and its racial implications and racial disparities with that. And so all these things been tied to, you know, public health and medical schools and higher education. Uh, what a time to have this book come out. Yeah, you know, that's, that's the interesting thing about uh, scholarship is uh, kind of the motivations that bring you to a body of work don't always align with pressing world needs. Uh, and yet, um, Sometimes these things come full circle. And that's a good place to start in this conversation about uh, this work. And, and let me hold it up since uh, we didn't have any good graphics um, in terms of, uh, you know, we're not at a bookstore and there's not a big poster of you in this work, but, but here's the book. And uh, it's really in, an incredible achievement. Very proud of you for it. Uh, so let's, let's start there. So, you know, what did, um, what motivated you to take on this particular subject area? And I'm going to characterize the book here as a history of the Black Freedom Movement as seen through the actions of college presidents, your words, and a national study covering the period between the 1940s and the 1960s, and looking at every aspect of Uni University of Life and Administration. That's a big, tall order. So talk to me a little bit about how you arrived in this space. You know, before I got to this big national historical study, uh, it started in my hometown, right, Bology, Alabama. And I always love to tell that story because I'm from a family of teachers, Khalil. And so my, my parents were small town, rural West Alabama school teachers. And my father's parents were also small town, rural West Alabama school teachers. And they started their careers in a one room, two room schoolhouses, right? So, you know, I'd always understood um, the role of education, it's linked to the Black Freedom Movement because they were members of the Black Teacher Associations. And we know about the organizing through the work of Vanessa Siddle Walker and others around what these Black Teacher Associations meant. So I understood that part. But by the time I started, you know, became a high schooler uh, myself, it was, it, you know, formal Jim Crow was long gone, but the remnants of that was still there because my public all Black high school in Utah, Alabama, the next town over, um, actually was around the corner from a predominantly white private academy, right? The segregation academies. And so even and tell, in my, tell, tell, tell everyone what that means, because that's meaningful in this moment is also. Yeah, absolutely. Right. So when it, when schools were forced to desegregate, right? Um, it, because there's obviously the Brown versus Board of Education decision in 54, but schools don't just voluntarily follow, you know, the law of the land. So once eventually forced by court orders and so forth to desegregate, what white families did was pull their children out of the public school system in Green County, Alabama, and elsewhere um, across the U.S. South and other places, and they started their own schools, right? So you want, you want to desegregate and have, you know, black students go to the public schools with us, we'll leave. But yeah. With public mind? dollars, right? I mean, that's the other part of it, right? Absolutely, right? And what, what's really interesting about that is they don't go far. In my case, they go around the corner, right? They get an, another piece of land that's right near where the public school was. And so the remnants of that were still there by the time, you know, I came through school. And so I'd always had these questions in the back of my mind about the decisions made by past educational leaders and the implications of those decisions on the present, right? Mm -hmm. And so that really pushed me to once I formally started to study the history of education, specifically for me, the history of higher education, I wanted to know about these college presidents because if these local educational leaders in my small county could have this kind of impact, imagine what U.S. colleges and universities, what kind of impact they could have, the leaders of those institutions, on shaping racial policies and practices uh, both within the academy and beyond. So that's really how I came to write this book. Yeah, I, I, I think that's one of the most fascinating parts of your book. And I want to just bookmark that for just a second and ask you one more setup question. And that yeah. is, so, so this is a, a really rich field, but often taken from the perspective of student activism itself and the relationship of that student activism 
uh, to the Black Freedom Movement. And so, of course, you cite Stefan Bradley's work, which uh, looks both a, in a micro study of what's happened at uh, Columbia University around uh, expansion struggles and displacement in Harlem to a, a broader study of Ivy League schools more generally, Martha Biondi's work, uh, Ibram Kendi's work, uh, his first book uh, being on uh, Black campus movements. So just talk to me a little bit about how, how your work is distinguished from that work uh, more particularly. Yeah, you know, it, those are some phenomenal authors that you just mentioned. I just love their work, admire their work. And so what's interesting is that I always like to mention that college presidents make a cameo all the time in these histories of student activism. Um, is most often uh, framed in a way that's reactive to the student protests, the students and their demands and so forth. And that's fair. I think that's important to understand that college presidents weren't distant from the moment. Students were making demands to somebody. Mm -hmm. But uh, what, I, what I wanted to know more about is sort of take, taking a different perspective and looking from this administrative level down is that in the same way that we think about student organizing and student networks and them being able to communi communicate across campuses, across state lines, or coast to coast, uh, the same thing was happening with college presidents. And what I've found in doing this work, taking the administrative perspective is that oftentimes the issues that students bring up, college presidents are well aware of those issues well before it becomes a sit-in in the president's office. And so it just gives us such a rich perspective on how things are happening on college campuses, how these academic leaders are communicating with each other, uh, both on campus and beyond, and just these networks and understanding that most often the issues that the academy tends to drag its feet on, uh, there is really some intentionality around being slow about it, not a matter of not knowing what the issues are. And so just when I think about the work of, you know, those previous, you know, scholars that you mentioned, uh, it's, it's I, you know, my, my work is directly in communication with them. It's almost a mirror uh, looking at the same issues, but from a different perspective. Yeah, yeah, I have two thoughts about that. Uh, I, I'm just sort of bubbling <laughs> over here with enthusiasm about this work because it's, it, it's so rich uh, and, and engaging. And I, I mean, I can only imagine, I don't know how many people are on this, uh, on this Zoom or watching, but anybody working in any context around diversity in higher education, man, you better read this book because uh, there's so much here. So the first thing I want to say about in response to that is kudos to you for taking the time to look at structures of power because um, there's been 30 years of incredible work looking at resistance to that power. And I take nothing away from it. I mean, that in, in many ways is what Bradley's work and Biondi's work. I mean, your point being that college presidents and their role in this is often more an abstraction than a real source. Um, and often the, the powers that be are moving around the campus rather than on the campus. And I just, uh, I just really appreciated in this book how you centered um, the key players in this narrative in ways that remind us that as, as much work as we can do uh, to learn how resistance has worked, we also have to be mindful of how power <laughs> is moving against resistance. And you used a term in, in that statement about intentionality. I'll admit to you, um, I've looked at power pretty closely over the past 10 years, really since I left Bloomington, first at the New York Public Library, where I ran the Schomburg and now at Harvard. And power likes to play dumb. I'll be as frank as I can put it likes to play dumb, likes to pretend as if it's staring at the face of a problem for the first time and saying, oh my gosh, we're going to look into this. Yeah, thanks so much for sharing this information. So, so maybe talk to us, you know, show us the receipts. Talk yeah. a little bit about that intentionality, because I think that's a powerful lesson for people who think that they're working inside uh, with people who have good faith, who are making good faith, faith efforts for change. Yeah, you know, that, that, you know, you can imagine me coming into the archives and seeing these, uh, you know, <laughs> these primary sources and saying, oh, this, this is just amazing, sort of mind blowing in a way. But what happens with these presidents, um, I, give, I give a brief example. I go to the University of Alabama, right? And there's this broader question around uh, when will the University of Alabama finally admit black students? And we know about, you know, the first attempt in 1956 with Arthur and Lucy and her enrollment, but only been there for three days before she's expelled. And then the more notable, you know, standing in the schoolhouse door attempt in, you know, 
1963. Okay, fine. So, George Wallace. You have to just right. name it so people are like, oh, yes. Okay, of course I know that. Yeah. George, George Wallace, segregationist, white supremacist governor of Alabama, vows never to desegregate the University of Alabama and takes a symbolic stand in blocking the door toward where the black students go in to register to become students, right? So, you know, just a powerful image of him standing there defying you. Okay, great. That's 1963. There's correspondence among administrators at the University of Alabama going back to 1949 about when are they finally going to admit black students. And so you can see a 14 year delay in the mm -hmm. process, right? This isn't just 63 happens and all of a sudden you get the Kennedy administration and now for the first time they're thinking about it. Uh, these things have been in place for so long. And I love the point that you, you, know, you bring out about how administrators react even in the contemporary context, when we look at public statements around the issue on campus, they're framed as a one-off issue, a right. one-time issue, like this isn't the culture of our university, we don't stand for this, we condemn this action, this is not who we are. But when you look at my book and you really get into the archives, looking at the formal records of presidents and their personal correspondence as well, you see that a number of these issues have been delayed intentionally for decades. And yeah. so that's something that uh, I think is just so insightful about when we're really trying to talk about resistance, we have to understand these administrators and the complexities of the decisions and what they've been grappling with well before we see the public statement. Yeah, so I, I, I wanna extend that point just a, a moment longer because one of the things that what your research shows by looking over essentially a generation of tumultuous change, both that's happening nationally and that is impacting what's happening on campus, which isn't just about um, integrating uh, Southern schools, right? I mean, that's part of the national story you tell. This is also about the role of the university in the broader community. And I, I, I wanna get on that because I think that's a big area of focus for, for our conversation. But it seems to me partly what you're saying is that um, every new president, we have to suspend belief that they haven't been briefed on a range of issues that are pertinent to how the university is going to continue and move forward. As if, one, there is no archive of the past presidents and how they uh, dealt with this, nor that maybe the trustees themselves are not playing an active role in shaping um, who precisely should be a president and what lessons ought to have been learned from what the last president did or did not do. Uh, talk to us a little bit of that and maybe give a specific example because one of the things you talk about at UCLA, UCLA is precisely this transition of power because maybe one particular chancellor got ahead of himself. Yes, absolutely right. So <laughs> Yeah, 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 right. And so I, I love picking on the UC and the UCLA uh, example that I lay out in the book because, you know, so Franklin Murphy becomes the chancellor of UCLA in 1960. And before that, he's the chancellor at the University of Kansas, KU, uh, through the 1950s. And that's a whole nother conversation about anti-intellectualism and what happens to him in Kansas that runs him out of town. But he comes to LA and he has his vision for what UCLA can become. It's not nearly the university that it is today. Uh, it's really in the shadow of Berkeley, right? And we're talking about 1960. With that said, he comes there and throughout the 1950s, the student NAACP chapter has been trying to get, you know, be registered formally as a student organization, which would give it access to student funds and they can program and plan around racial issues and the fight for racial equity in LA, Southern California, so forth, right? He comes there and immediately he's on board with that, right? He wants to, you know, let's take out discrimination on UCLA campus, but also in Westwood, right? So this is the beauty of these presidents shaping things both on campus and beyond. Franklin Murphy is adamant about just ending discrimination in all of, all of its forms. That's a beautiful quote in the book that, I, that he says something like that. But the University of California system has a system president. And Clark Kerr is president of the UC system. Franklin Murphy, for the first time, reports to a president instead of directly to a board of regents or board of trustees. And so butting heads, Clark Kerr is not ready for UCLA to outpace the rest of the system, particularly how he envisions the University of California and its engagement with social issues, which California, look, it, it's got this liberal reputation has had it for a long time. Even Du Bois in his early writings, right, talks about California seemingly having no limits on your opportunities, right? Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. It has this liberal reputation, but California is so far from that. Um, and it's, you know, conservative California has a stronghold on the University of California system and making sure that no student organization can engage off campus social issues. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine if that's a policy at any university right now for students not to organize around something happening off campus? But right. that was in place. So when you talk about these administrators and uh, some of the roadblocks and the hiccups they would, they would come into, there's so much pushback and so many things that they understand, again, before it becomes public knowledge that I think that's worthwhile uh, pointing out. So what a great example. It, it is a great example. And, and I, again, I, I just want to highlight to people because I think that sometimes we miss why this, re, what the stakes are. So, so partly what you're, you're showing in this bureaucratic example mm -hmm. is that governance structures themselves are put in place in the wake of challenges internally. So let's just, let's extend this out uh, for a moment. Um, you could imagine uh, <laughs> a kind of school within a university where a dean all of a sudden is, 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 is a born again anti-racist evangelist for, uh, for leading the charge. And all of a sudden the dean finds that that person is no longer in control of their budget because the provost now has been given budgetary control over the dean. Now this, is, this doesn't happen easily in all places and most certainly is more likely to happen in a public system than in a private system. But I think part of your takeaway from that, that uh, chapter is, is to note that when there are real change agents within big systems, oftentimes bureaucracy is used against change. Yes, absolutely. I mean, so it's- comes after? So talk, I mean, just to give the point, like, so um, uh, I'm forgetting it, Murphy leaves and describe the person who succeeds him. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Well, at Mur Murphy, <laughs> it's a complicated, right? So Murphy leaves and then, you know, Charles Young comes next um, as the chancellor at UCLA. Uh, but I mean, but also Kerr uh, gets fired, but then, you know, get the Reagan uh, governorship comes in next, right? So there's this series of events. I mean, I'm glad you pointed that out because these things don't just happen and then we move on, right? It's the next person and then the next person and then the next person. And that's so insightful about the system, the, you, you know, me, right? I'm in the UC system. It is as complicated as you can imagine to get something done. And that's not by happenstance, Khalil. Right. Like, I mean, higher education by design, uh, through state constitutions, through legislative actions, so forth. These, these systems are put in place that really stifles, you know, the, you know like you said, the, the, the renew, the new dean, the new chancellor that comes in on fire, you know, you can imagine there are a ton of administrators this summer after, say, Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, and so forth, that felt fired up and said they, felt, you, they had to go do something. Right. And somewhere between this summer and right now, you haven't seen much change, right? <laughs> right, right. There's, there's a whole lot of people uh, reporting to the general counsel. I love how, you know, kind of the hidden secret of, uh, of organizations, whether they're nonprofit or private, is that, like, the general counsel basically runs every organization in America. Yes. <laughs> because at the end of the day, no matter who you are, the CEO, the, the chief this, the provost that, the general counsel is like, mm, nope, uh, the law says we can't do this. And so you're like, well, I'm not going to get fired because the general counsel told me not to do it. And so then it's done, right? Yeah, absolutely. And even and that's the case in the 1960s, right? I mean, the, uh, the UC is, that, you know, just to keep picking on the UC, that <laughs> happens when there's some UCLA students go to Mississippi for the Freedom Rides in summer 61. And they're arrested in Mississippi for trying to challenge segregation in public highway facilities with the Freedom Rides. And they're arrested. They're thrown into parchment the state penitentiary in Mississippi. And then they have to go back and forth and raise money around bail and make court appearances in Mississippi and so forth. And one idea that comes up that Franklin Murphy, again, supports is can we just use some student funds to help bail our students out of jail? They're fighting for racial equality is clearly against what we stand for. It's like it's community service, right? Like the service project today, right? Which is more marketing than real. <laughs> Absolutely. And then what happens is there's this, all this correspondence going to University of California uh, attorneys. Like, can we do this? Can we not do this? Would this damage our tax exemption status? Mm -hmm. If we give these funds to challenge civil rights? Like all of these uh, questions come up that you just know, as you pointed out, right now are still happening. Uh, legal counsel 
has certainly pumped the brakes on right. some you know, some administrators. Yeah. So 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 we're gonna move from from UFC. We're gonna cut 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 uh, the UC system some slack now. Though we have another UFC to talk about. Uh, but before we talk about that one, uh, mm -hmm. so talk to us about uh, President uh, Martin Jenkins. Uh, so he he kind of serves as a kind of a hero in this story. Um, and kind of your point is to situate how some of that power works. What, 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 just to set it up, I mean, the, the thing that is most interesting to me is that we often think of HBCUs as operating in these silos. You know, yes, they're under-resourced. Uh, yes, they are a creature of, of segregation. Um, but we often think like, of course, you know, Black folks are, they have their autonomy. They're doing, you know, what they, um, are, are set out to do, and if they're not achieving, or or if they're focusing in one area or another, then you know that's the choice they make. But actually, you tell a, quite a different story about how power works for a black college president operating within an HBU system. Yeah, that, that's that's a, a great point. Martin Jenkins uh, definitely stands out as a, an activist president, if you will. Um, so Martin Jenkins um, is a black president of a black college, Morgan State in Baltimore. And leading Morgan State of Baltimore gives some fascinating nuance to not only uh, within the South, in segregated states, upper South versus deep South, but also what it means to lead a state supported black college mm -hmm. uh, during this time while challenging segregation. So Martin Jenkins, um, hands down, is just, just a fascinating scholar, even by today's standards, just how much he was able to produce before becoming a president of uh, Morgan State. Brief background. Uh, Howard University educated undergrad, Northwestern University master's and PhD, brief faculty career mostly at Howard going back to his alma mater and then gets tapped to become the president of Morgan State. Once he gets to Morgan State president in 1948, which is important, uh, this is after the Pearson v. v. Murray case that forced the University of Maryland to desegregate his law school, but University of Maryland only desegregated his law school. The rest of the campus stayed all white and segregated. So that gives some context around, you know, his presidency, the segregated big University of Maryland um, in Morgan State. But Morgan State at the time is fascinating because it has its own independent board of trustees, mm -hmm. which is rare for a black college, which means that it can lobby on behalf of itself to the state house in Annapolis, as, a, as opposed to say, uh, going through an all white board of trustees that say in Alabama or Mississippi had, that was responsible for the black colleges as well. Right. So Martin Jenkins is in a constant fight to maintain that independence because uh, the University of Maryland doesn't like the fact that Morgan State has such independence and is quickly growing. It's notable that Morgan State, you know, has about 1,600 students through the 1950s compared to the state's other black colleges that probably got a couple hundred students. Mm -hmm. So it's growing too fast. It's got this Howard educated president who's a scholar educated at Northwestern who has published a lot and who has no hesitance about the intellectual belief, uh, you know, the intellectual ability of black students and what they can do and so forth. So he's in a constant fight and he has to use these hidden networks, mm -hmm. uh, these silent networks among, you know, black organizations, be it the black press, black fraternities and sororities, black women organizations, black civic groups, as well as he's well connected with the editor of the Washington Post, which is notable. So he's published in these white run academic journals as well. He's got a network that goes all the way up to the White House, if you will, because he ends up sitting on one of the uh, President Harry Truman is one of his commissions or something of that nature, right? And so he uses these networks to make a lot of silent decisions that he can't publicly make because of the nature of trying to protect Morgan State from upsetting uh, basically white races in Maryland. Um, and so he's just fascinating and he becomes so good at it that other black college presidents oftentimes tap him to come to their campus and give speeches and statements that they cannot. And I, I lay out a, a beautiful example of him going down to Fort Valley, Georgia. You can imagine going to Georgia. The, yeah. president, the, the, the president of that black college cannot say the things that Martin Jenkins has been saying. And so he comes in and delivers a speech that actually supports student activism, challenges the idea of segregation, and really calls for you know, more support of black colleges. Uh, so, I mean, talk about a hero. Talk about somebody brave. It takes as much courage to um, go to these places and, and do these things as well as to those other presidents to strategically bring him in. And if wind of it got back to white leadership, they could say, hey, I didn't know he was going to say that. 
Uh, I mean, you just talk about just how savvy, uh, how much ingenuity uh, these black leaders had to have. It really sets up the tone for the rest of the book. Yeah, I, and, and I love how you frame uh, that chapter of the book because partly what you are, why you position Jenkins in this way is because you cast a broad um, view of uh, the way that essentially white elites still control the fate of institutions that are ostensibly black run and independent, but in fact, they aren't. Yes. Uh, and maybe just characterize, so, so we have an, a better sense of, of Jenkins and his legacy, but we maybe just for a moment longer, talk about what were the sources of pressure on black presidents, whether it was state or private, um, uh, in terms of the, the range of pressures, because some of them are more direct and others are more indirect. Yeah, no, yeah, I mean, the pressures, I mean, there's a list, right? If I had a scroll, I just, you know, roll it out and just start reading from it. So there's obviously state pressure around budget and finances and so forth. There's pressure from the leaders of white colleges and universities who don't often think about that. You think about the black colleges and communication directly to, you know, state senators and the, the governor and so forth. But there's also these presidents of, say, the University of Maryland. I mean, Curly Bird is a name that if you if you hadn't heard of it, I mean, it, he's the president of the University of Maryland wants to maintain segregation so bad it eventually attempts to run for governor of Maryland, right? I mean, these, these are the kind of people who are putting pressure on Morgan State to adhere and maintain segregation. Right. There's all, I mean, there, there's also, I mean, you can get into uh, philanthropy, right? I mean, this is at, at a time where you've got everything from the Carnegie Corporation to the Rockefeller for I mean, all of these really major boards uh, that are controlling money uh, that goes to black colleges or intentionally not to black colleges. I mean, just there's so many things um, going against them. And then there's also community pressure, right? There's not just, you know, there's the, the black activist community organizers that are adamant that enough is enough. I mean, we're post-World War II and black colleges staying within this white supremacist system isn't going to cut it anymore. So there's also pressure to engage with the black community as well. Um, and so, I mean, it's coming from all sides, truly. Yeah. I mean, so just to be able to be in that position is, yeah. yeah. Th th those pressure examples, uh, there's a line you use that you essentially say that white power brokers um, are surgically appointing black people who they think, whether yes. they live up to their expectations or not, who they think will play along. Yes. I think, I think that that's something that is a major takeaway about how we understand black leadership uh, over the past, uh, you know, really hundred years and, and even to this very day, you know, what are the stakes for who is appointed to do what work? Um, so we have about 10 more minutes for you and I to chop it up. And I, I just wanted to, uh, so this, this, this aspect of the book um, that I think is, for me, probably the most um, impactful, um, at least in terms of how I think about my own career. And I find this the most fascinating argument of the book. You write that college presidents, in terms of responsibility to varying stakeholders, function like elected officials. Yeah. And those you studied as college presidents were unwitting and sometimes willing architects of managing the demands of movement activists on campus, but most surprisingly off campus as well. As you state, they actively, though often quietly shaped racial policy, both inside and outside the educational sphere. For example, it was elite private university presidents who coordinated federal, state, and local funding to redevelop university, I'm sorry, urban centers at the expense of black and undeserved citizens. So many university presidents today, Eddie, like to think or pretend that they as leaders in a huge industry of higher education don't have responsibility for the policies that define the systems now under scrutiny for being racist by d design. So, so let's make, in our last 10 minutes, let's make this as plain as possible what you mean about university presidents, particularly of private elite universities mm. that function like elected officials. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, they, sh let's just get right more like unelected officials. <laughs> <laughs> All right, appointed, right, officials, uh, if you will. All right, so here's the deal. Uh, let's, let's pick on, you know, the urban renewal and housing discrimination, which you just mentioned, um, as, a, as a great example 
uh, which was much more, I know Stephen Bradley has written about this, but just seeing the action of the college presidents um, was really disheartening to understand that history, even for me in the archives, you know, working through it. Uh, so here's the deal, right? So post-World War II, and we know about, I mean, just urban history, if you will, right? There's restrictive covenants, when black people, you know, leave the South and move to Philadelphia, New York, Chicago, so forth, and they can only move into certain neighborhoods. Okay, great. All right, we got that. Post World War II, uh, what happens is, you know, those, you know, restricted covenants are struck down, but then they get into, okay, well, what's another way we can maintain housing discrimination? And so you have overcrowding as more migration comes to major cities outside of the U.S. South. And what happens is these black communities start to get closer and closer to the physical campus of the University of Chicago. University of Pennsylvania, uh, NYU, Harvard. I mean, I mean, these these things are happening everywhere, right? You pick a major city from Milwaukee. Out, I mean, you, it, it happens, right? So what college presidents do in 1957, Lawrence Kipton is the chancellor of University of Chicago. And it's important to name him because these names are important. These aren't institutions doing things on their own. These are people making decisions under the, the auspice of universities, right? And so Lawrence Kipton in 1957 organizes a meeting between the president of MIT, Harvard, Penn, and Yale. And these five men come together and say, what we need to do is actually turn our attention toward Washington, D.C., um, you know, and they're in conversation with the Eisenhower administration in shaping federal housing policies. Mm -hmm. And so urban renewal funds end up being funneled by the millions to colleges and universities as some crazy ratio of like $3 to one or something that if a university puts a one, the federal government will put up three. Um, and you can look at how many millions goes to university and they just start buying up this property and slum prop, you know, right? not only have they uh, perpetuated housing discrimination by, you know, funding restrictive covenants. Once they've created these slum conditions, then all of a sudden the slum conditions are a problem, and then they want to displace thousands of black households. I mean, it's it's an American historical tale, um, and so you see these elected officials, if you will, uh, that I like the characterization of, of such, and that how they engage so many different stakeholders, and how at the end of the day, they're in D.C. They're actively lobbying to federal officials. Uh, they're all in, you know, cahoots with each other, right? Because you get, you know, the they're testifying before Senate budgetary committees, and that really fundamentally changes the way we think about the U.S. American housing system and its relationship to the American college and university. I mean, let's just make it clear, make it plain that housing discrimination, which is one of the most prevalent and straightforward forms of racist acts in American history is largely at the doing of academic leaders. That's, that's as simple as it. Yeah, you know, I, think, I think that that can't be overstated in the way that you uh, show the evidence of this um, concerted role that is played. Uh, my colleague, uh, Elizabeth Cohen, has written a book about one of the leading uh, uh, urban planners, uh, for, for whatever reason, his name is escaping me, uh, and he starts his career essentially working uh, for Yale and and doing a major urban renewal project in New Haven. And and while he, in the end, comes out on the side of history as having been more progressive than not, he learns from his mistakes about um, how power is mal distributed in these conversations about decision making, and basically ends his career spending a lot more time listening to the community. I mean, one of the things you talk about in this dance of resistance to official behavior, whether it is coming from the university administration or from Washington, D.C. Or, or the state capitol, um, is that Black folks and, 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 and some of their white progressive allies, as in the story of the University of Chicago and Hyde Park, are always there. It's not like these people are doing these things um, and, and regretting it later on, like, oh my God, we didn't realize. There mm -hmm. is active, yes. active manipulation. Um, yeah. There's active resistance. You describe this as a large scale public relations friendly commitment to racial equality um, by appointing black faculty in some of these instances, by you know, making claims that we support uh, racial uh, equality on campus. And yet behind the scenes, the hired lawyers are working triple time 
to beat back every claim of justice and equality by various community stakeholders, um, including formal civil rights organizations. Yeah, no, I mean, this is clear, right? The, the, that chapter on housing discrimination um, starts off with this quote that I just love, is the octopus in the South has tentacles in the North. And I think that's a perfect example of how um, there was this, this, this vision among these particular you know, liberal university, these particular academic leaders have seen themselves as, well, we enroll black students. We have some black faculty. We're certainly not the University of Georgia. You know, we're not, you know, we're not Mississippi. We're far better than that. And so there's this outward image. I mean, there's a strategic public relations media effort to frame what these universities were doing as something positive to save American cities, right? Yeah. I mean, you can't ask for better coverage than being in the New York Times, right? The Wall Street Journal, all of these major outlets covered what these universities were doing to uh, part of urban renewal and really gonna revitalize the American city. While at the same time, internal correspondence is very clear that this is very much about Negro slums, right? So one thing publicly to never say is about race, to say it's about you know economic prosperity and helping the cities, and then privately to see that it's very much a black issue. And knowing that black activists and community organizers and preachers and teachers were up in arms in the moment, right? Yeah. So, you know, there's something that when college presidents talk to me now, it's something I always say that it's critical to listen, right? You have to see the community as an equal educational partner in the educational enterprise. This isn't one of those things where, yeah, we're going to send a few dollars over to the community, you know, and we've done that part. But it's really about actually be listening and hearing what the concerns of the community are and trying to figure out how does the university fit within the community's goals as opposed to using the community to fit within the university's goals and so perfect example right there i mean i just it's, it's we see it in the past we see it today yeah no so so i have so many things i'm thinking about we're two minutes away from opening uh, the conversation up uh, so i just want to remind people that if they have a question they can include it in the q a and uh, we'll get to them in just a moment so just a couple things to just to stay on this a moment longer you have a, a couple things uh that's that i wrote down just to remember you have a headline and i'm not sure which newspaper but it's one of the national papers you described that what's going on uh, with the University of Chicago, Chicago's struggle to save a high Q square mile, high IQ square mile. I mean, so, so what you haven't talked about uh, with greater detail. I looked in the the, the bibliography, and you know, since uh, since I knew you when, I thought there's no reason for Eddie to cite my work uh, in this book, the condemnation of blackness. You know, this is about college presidents and higher education, and there it is. I thought that's curious. And so then when I read the book, I'm like, oh, well, here it is. I mean, essentially the trope of black criminals. I mean, it's just all over yes. the correspondence about rapists and murderers and burglars. It's so crazy um, how much the university itself is reflecting all of the racist um, ideas and policy beliefs um, that is happening everywhere in the nation, whether it's North and South, that you give an example that a local property manager is being challenged by a white faculty member who wants to move into an apartment and there's some concern that the faculty member is too cozy with black people and might actually have black guests and therefore that person should be denied access to that property. Do I have that right? You have that right. You have that completely right. That, that appears in a Hyde Park Herald uh, but also in the Chicago American has a stage photo of a burglar standing behind this dilapidated, you know, this building falling apart and reaching out to mug a woman walking by, right? This like, obviously it's a stage photo, but the, the burglar is dark, right? Right. right? Yeah. You can't see their race, but it implies so much, right? And so, yeah, absolutely, right? Your work, you understand how, how this is played and how the American college is part of it and using crime as justification, right? Even, even though we know the data around crime was skewed, right? And all this sort of, right? Using crime and violence and as justification for why these Black people need to be moved, for right. why they can't be close to campus. Yeah. And, you know, and so we, yeah, again, we've got a few black faculty members. We got a few dozen black students, even though University of Chicago at the time only had one or 2% black students. Uh, they made sure that they got 
their bang for the buck saying that they've got black students. Uh, even in that case- One of them is gonna be Thomas Sowell eventually. <laughs> <laughs> so they were also picking which black students they wanted to bring yeah. to campus. Very intentional with that as well. Uh, yeah. yeah, so anyway, it's, it's so much. Well, I, I have one last thought on this point, which is that we hear so much in this moment about the racial wealth gap. And we hear so much concern about systemic racism and so much effort and energy uh, being put to supporting it. I know in the wake of the Floyd protests, Larry Backhow at, at Harvard University uh, issued a, a, a several solidarity statements and put a lot of pressure on the deans to show good faith effort. And it's, you know, it strikes me reading your book that at the same time that how Harvard uh, and other universities have taken a page from Craig Stephen Wilder's work, Ebony and Ivany, and have started to dig up their own reckoning with slavery and the relationship of slavery to uh, the early building of the university going back to the 17th century for so many of these Ivy League schools. When I think about my own university campus and I learn from your story, I think like the reckoning and reparations debate about the past is now squarely centered around the role of universities and elite universities in particular in, in literally being part of the moment of redlining and systemically racist housing discrimination, which if everybody is right, is a direct proximate cause of the 10 times wealth gap that black people experience today. Yeah. And so I think you've opened the can of worms, my friend, um, <laughs> that, that um, hint, hint out there, um, people ought to be paying attention to when it comes to the direct relationship that these universities have to their own wealth um, and the lack of wealth for the communities that surround them, um, because it's not like the universities are innocent uh, in this story. No, not at all. Um, you've got it spot on. We don't have to go back to um, you know, the formal institution of slavery to point out things that our universities need to reckon with. We don't have to go back that far. I mean, we can go back 50, 60 years and see some serious decisions that impact uh, everything, not, not some things, but everything around race today, all courtesy of the American College and University. Yeah. So we've got, we've got uh, some questions and I'm gonna read the first one here. Okay. Uh, are there any models you've come across in your research of private universities and colleges reinvesting in their cities and towns in a way that's beneficial instead of predatory? Do you think it's possible or is the relationship inherently inequitable? Um, I don't have any um, examples of that, um, even though that's a, a great question, particularly of private colleges and universities. Um, I think it remains to be seen. I think there are some things that are promising that are happening. Um, you know, I'm always intrigued by, um, you know, since you asked about private institutions, USC, University of Southern California, um, being in South LA, uh, formerly known as South Central LA, uh, rebranding uh, that region, of that part of the city. But I mean, that's promising. It remains to be seen where this goes. Um, but is, is there hope for the future? Sure. But I think, um, you know, as Khalil just said, if we truly, uh, you know, grapple with this history and engage it and be honest about it, then I think we can start to make some changes. But as long as we're looking at, uh, you know, racial disparities, as a one-off, right? As, you know, something that's happening, you know, in this moment, it's never gonna be genuine enough to make that real change. Um, and that's where we gotta get, we've gotta get to the point where we can be honest about history, honest about what we've done, our mistakes in the past, um, because so few universities wanna do that. It's easy to talk about the 1700s, right? Oh yeah, yeah, but, right. but when you're talking about people who, you know, in some cases, maybe in their 90s, still alive, right? You, when you're talking about real-time legacy of people that you know or remember meeting, you know, 10 years ago, it's harder to be honest about those histories as opposed to condemning university leaders from 200 years ago. Yeah, well, I, I wouldn't even say in the 90s. Listen, you know, I grew up in Hyde Park. Um, yeah. and, uh, and I have a good friend uh, whose father was Allison Davis, who was the first black tenured member at the University of Chicago. His name is Gordon Davis. So when I read 
some of the evidence you present where you say black Chicagoans paid $12.5 million more in apartment rent than whites and $157 million more than whites for home rentals or purchases. Yes. Uh, this is not an abstraction, nor is it something uh, that even pertains to a 90 year old today. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's very real. I wanted to, um, we have one more question, but uh, before we move on to that one, I wanted to um, respond to that first question also. And that is to say that uh, first to remind folks that, you know, the heart of your research is historical. Um, and so you, you, you didn't give yourself the task or responsibility to survey the current landscape in a way that you would necessarily know all that might be happening. Uh, so that means that there's opportunity for others to contribute to that, um, to answering that question. But I do want to give the example of Brown University and President Ruth Simmons, and mostly because um, she just uh, joined a conference that uh, I held with my team. I run something called the Institutional Anti-Racism and Accountability Project, and we hosted a conference called Truth and Transformation 2020 just, uh, just last Friday. And, uh, and she gave a keynote where she talked about Brown University looking into its own slavery past at her urging back in 2000, is either 2001 or 2003. That's and right. she says, and so this is, she says two things that are totally relevant. Um, and then one thing that is an answer to that question. She says that when she first proposed that the university investigate its own uh, role in slavery and the wealth generated by the Atlantic slave trade in Rhode Island, uh, which was a capital um, of the New England new slave trade, precisely because of the relationship of of um, shipbuilding um, and the trade itself, she said that uh, a trustee said to her essentially, you know, why don't you guys just get over this? You know, it's really just time to move on. And then the second thing <laughs> was that uh, once you do this, you'll never be able to fundraise. Um, mm -hmm. And she said that at the end of it, they raised far more money uh, than they expected. And so that's a lesson to uh, the person asking the question uh, to some degree about um, how you can do this work and defy expectations and most certainly take some solace and measure of justice that you're actually gonna be on the right side of history. The last thing that uh, Brown University did when it issued its recommendations, and this is um, as recently as 2000 and, when did the report come out? Seven or about 10 years ago, um, they agreed to a $10 million endowment to support local um, schools in the Providence School District and a number of other school related investments that require Brown University to have an ongoing commitment uh, to helping to fund education of school children in that area, including um, guaranteeing a few slots, and I say a few just because I don't know the precise number, I can't remember the precise number, for those students to attend Brown University. So. Uh, you know, might it have taken uh, the first and only now black president of an Ivy League school and the first woman uh, president of, uh, of any background to run an Ivy League school to do this kind of work? Perhaps. Yeah. Yeah. yeah All right. So a uh, question here is one problem I see in colleges is exploiting black students in sports for unpaid labor. Do you touch on that in your book? Oh, yeah. Well, you know, there are numerous uh, sports examples in the book. Um, yeah, one being um, UCLA, uh, just to go back uh, full circle, I guess, in our conversation, that um, sports have been used strategically by college administrators, uh, particularly around race, for uh, quite some time now. So if you're interested in what we're seeing right now is pandemic college football uh, with disproportionate number of Black students uh, participating, then yeah, you would find um, some relevance in the book as well, because uh, one example is UCLA plays in Houston in the fall of 61 basketball. So John Wooden is the coach and they've got three black players and those players are harassed in Houston, uh, racist taunts and so forth. And ultimately afterwards, um, Franklin Murphy at UCLA uh, goes to the system leadership and says, we got to change our policy around playing these segregated schools. Like we know there are good basketball teams down South, but we can't keep going down there if we're going to be real about um, having these black athletes on our team. And so actually Franklin Murphy used that as an example uh, to kind of leverage the student vote that came forth around supporting the UCLA Freedom Riders. Uh, so you see the connection between sports and race and civil rights and broader questions around black students and what does that mean? Um, so yeah, I mean, exploitation in the purest sense around 
you're black and you're forced to go play in Mississippi or forced to go play in, you know, Houston in this example. So that form of exploitation, but then leveraging it at least uh, toward having a, a broader conversation. Yeah, there are examples like that in the book. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I appreciate that, um, that focus. Listen, I'm going to uh, take on one more question that I had prepared, which I think is also very relevant uh, because we didn't talk about it. So you sort of the last uh, chapter of the book talks about mm -hmm. affirmative action. Yeah. And um, you talk about the relationship of the program and what it does to HBCUs and what it means uh, for uh, white universities and colleges to take up this work. So, so maybe share a bit about your findings there. Yeah, yeah, the book finishes talking about the origins of affirmative action in higher education. And ultimately, you have the Kennedy administration in 1963, after intense global pressure um, to how race and segregation is looking in America, President Kennedy actually turns toward college presidents and asks university leaders across the nation, be it leading a predominantly white institution or black colleges as well, ask them to help come up with special programs that can help, that will address racial equity, inequities um, in American history. And so briefly for a moment, 63, well into 1964, college presidents start meeting together, black leaders, white leaders representing the system of US higher education to come up with programs that can address these issues, right? Uh, there's a meeting at Cambridge, April, 1964 at, at MIT. Uh, where these black presidents from down south come up and they're meeting to come up with these programs. And ultimately what emerges um, is, you know, exchange programs, uh, partnerships between these wealthier, well-resourced white universities and black colleges, their uh, faculty development programs to where black college faculty during the summers can work on graduate degrees. Uh, there are all these programs, the majority of which are focused on black colleges. Can you imagine that? Affirmative action, American higher education, most programs, federal support geared toward black colleges. But there's one program that's specific to white universities and that's race conscious admissions, basically meaning actively going into certain areas and getting more black students at the University of Chicago, Michigan, Wisconsin, those kind of places. Yep. What happened, what I demonstrated in the book is how the white presidents at these selective, highly selective white institutions ultimately ignore and dismantle those programs that will focus on black colleges. And the lasting, you know, legacy of that decision is what we see today when we debate affirmative action. So really, when we're debating whether affirmative action, race conscious admissions is legal or not, and does it have relevance or not, we're really having the most narrow form of argument around the idea of affirmative action, when in reality, we should have seen system-wide change within American higher education, instead of a debate that's largely focused on a few dozen predominantly white institutions. Yeah, that is that's, that's uh, that is the final word for today, but hopefully the first uh, word for you to be engaged enough to pick up this book and uh, and extend your learning around this topic. Thanks so much, Eddie. I've really enjoyed talking to you about this and reading the book. So I just need to get it signed now. Absolutely, we'll get that done, Khalil. Thank you, I appreciate your time. You're welcome. Thank you both for being here. And yes, absolutely buy the book. There is a link in the chat. If you would like to purchase it, you should. It's amazing, do yourself a favor. Khalil, Eddie, thank you so much for being here and talking to us today. This has been such an amazing conversation. And thank you to everyone at home who's been tuning in and showing up for our authors, publishers, indie bookselling, and our incredible staff here at Harvard Bookstore. We really appreciate your support and your time. Take care, everyone. Stay safe. Wear masks. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank Have you. Have a good one.